All right. So. Oh, no worries. Oh, you already have one. Does this one work? Can people hear me? No. No. Okay. Uh, All right. It's, it's so a little more ado. First time doing this, give us a little break. All right. Well, thank you all for coming out. Really appreciate it. I want to thank the Mizzou College Republicans for showing an enormous amount of backbone and fortitude, putting this together on such short notice and doing the hard work of making people aware of the event. Yeah, we have a round of applause for them, for sure. I want to thank Young America's Foundation because they really did put this together on extremely short notice. They called me Saturday night and asked if, if we could put something together uh, and, and everything snowballed from there. And so let's have a round of applause for YAF, please. <laughs> and I want to thank the police who have, who have done an incredible job making sure that everything stays safe. Even the left should thank the police, even if you're too busy calling them racist murderers without evidence. Uh, since you need to, call, you, you probably should thank them for, for doing what they do, since if you need to call somebody in case I hurt your feelings tonight, it's going to be them. <laughs> you precious little snowflakes, you. <laughs> okay, I want to start by telling you a story. It's not from this campus. It's from a, another campus, Vanderbilt University in Tennessee. Just a couple of days ago, uh, on Monday, 200 students decided that they'd had it with the administration. They decided they were going to protest the administration. Uh, they, they were upset about the microaggressions of the administration. They didn't cite any particular incidents. They couldn't explain what the administration had done that was dramatically wrong. So they went and they protested. They demanded diversity classes and a more diverse university, you know, all the usual list of demands that have more to do with racism of skin color than they do with actual diversity of thought. Well, the next day after all this happened, a bag of poop showed up at the front door of the Bishop Joseph Johnson Black Cultural Center. And the end of the world ensued, as it's likely to do these days. And the student activist group rushed to Facebook, and they announced the, what they called the Vile Act. And they said, quote, the violation of a place that in many ways is the sole home for many black students is deplorable. As many of us sit in grief, recognize that these types of actions are what we speak of when we note the reality of exclusion and isolation of students of color, and specifically black students, on our campus. The police investigated, and they didn't end up finding it, they didn't end up prosecuting anyone. So clear instance of systemic racism, right? Well, not so much. Turns out the bag of dog dew was put there by a blind girl. The blind girl had been walking her dog. She picked up do, dog dew in the bag, and she couldn't locate the nearest trash can. So she did what she had been instructed to do, which is you leave it outside of a building so that the next civilized person who walks out takes it and throws it in the garbage. So pretty quickly, th this happened just this week. Pretty quickly, the student group had to come out with an apology. They ended up deleting the post and apologizing. And then, this is just the best part because the left never sleeps, they issued a statement about how the needs of students with disabilities on the campus were also marginalized. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's too wonderful. The, the, victim is, the victimology of the left just never ends. It, it starts and it never stops. So, let's talk about some of the elements of this victimology here, this victim mentality that now dominates America's college campuses and the American left more broadly because campuses are the tip of the spear when it comes to the American left. Let's, let's get a couple of preliminaries out of the way. First of all, yes, racism exists. There are individual racists and they do racist things. Second thing, okay, systemic racism, systemic racism exists when you can show either laws or regulations discriminating against people or when you can show that there are racists using an organization in order to systemically discriminate against people. If you can't show any of this, then you're just full of shit. <laughs> if you can't show systemic racism at Mizzou, you instead rely on stupid garbage like white privilege and microaggressions to help you create a safe space. Grow up, gang. You're not doing yourselves, the school, or the country any good at all with this sort of nonsense. You're making actual racism and aggression more common, and I'll explain why. So first of all, let's start with the, the notion of white privilege, which has become this buzzword that you hear all the time now. White privilege is responsible for everything up to and including the Kardashians. It's responsible for everything, white privilege. White privilege is a way to silence anybody who is not of color. That's what white privilege is. It is just a leftist bullshit term that means shut up because you are not a member of a minority group, a privileged minority group in the leftist space. It's reverse racism of the highest order. 
You're basically saying to white people who aren't racist, and you can't find any proof of their racism, that they must be racist because they're white. That is called racism. If you are accusing somebody of something simply because of the color of their skin without any evidence, that's called racism, gang. But you don't have to trust me. We, let, let's go through what, what other people say the definition of white privilege is. You know, folks on the left, what do they say that white privilege is? Well, here's the definition of white privilege from the Southern Poverty Law Center. There's a, a book that I'm sure was just a massive bestseller in its day called White Anti-Racist Activism, A Personal Roadmap. <laughs> and the only person who bought it was the, was the author, Jennifer Holliday's mother. But, this, uh, <laughs> but apparently, her mother works for the Southern Poverty Law Center because here is the definition of white privilege that they quote over at the SPLC. For people who don't know, the SPLC is an extraordinarily far-left organization uh, that, that pushes the notion that basically anybody who is conservative and on the right side of the aisle must be a member of a hate group. So here is their definition of white privilege. Quote, white skin privilege is not something that white people necessarily do, create, or enjoy on purpose. Unlike the more overt individual and institutional manifestations of racism, White skin privilege is a transparent preference for whiteness that saturates our society. White skin privilege serves several functions. First, it provides white people with perks that we do not earn and that people of color do not enjoy. Second, it creates real advantages for us. White people are immune to a lot of challenges. And finally, white privilege shapes the world in which we live, the way we navigate and interact with one another and with the world. Okay, when my daughter spits up, she's 22 months old, when, when she spits up, it sounds like this. So let's talk about the let's talk about the perks. <laughs> let's talk about the perks that white privilege supposedly confers upon you. So she says, the, the author here, she says that perks that are conferred upon you by white privilege include things like when you go to the grocery store and you get a band-aid, the band-aid is your skin tone. Seriously, is what she says. Right? The, for, for those who live in the real world, this is also called the free market because most of the people in the country happen to have a lighter shade of skin. And if you want to sell more Band-Aids, then you are going to market to the group of people who buy more Band-Aids. But no, this is white skin privilege. Another example she uses is she says that if you go to a hotel, that the, the hotel shampoo works better with your hair if you're white than if you're black. I don't know how she scientifically tested this, but in any case, this is, again, if, if this is as far as white skin privilege goes, I can tell you nobody should use hotel shampoo because it's gross. <laughs> and then she talks about the real advantages that are conferred upon you by white skin privileges. So what are those advantages? And this is where we really get to the meat of the matter. She says those advantages include skin color, quote, not working against me in terms of how people perceive my financial responsibility, style of dress, public speaking skills, or job performance, as well as people not assuming I got where I am professionally because of my race, and store security personnel or law enforcement officers do not harass me, pull me over, or follow me because of my race. So this is the argument, that America is a deeply racist country that is imbued with this white skin privilege, and that if you are black, you can never overcome this white skin privilege because you live in a deeply racist system that has been created by Western civilization, a Western civilization founded on racism, sexism, and bigotry. So. Before, I, I want to go through all of these specifics because I think it's important for people to actually assess whether these things are true in the United States at current. And I don't care about, let, let me put one thing first. I don't care about your feelings. Like just, just make, be perfectly clear, I, I care nothing about your feelings. I care, I don't want to hear about your feelings. I don't want to hear about your subjective, your subjective emotions. I don't want to hear about your heart cries out. To the, I don't care, you're not my wife, you're not my kid, I don't give a damn. Okay, so that being the case, let's actually talk about what is provable and what is not provable and what accusations have been leveraged and which ones are actually supportable. Okay, first of all, statistical disparity does not necessarily mean discrimination. This is the first thing you need to know. Okay, anybody who's ever been in a statistics class knows that this is true. Right, if they still teach statistics and it's not too much of a microaggression. <laughs> so, so, statistical disparity does not always mean a discrimination. The vast majority of people who play in the NBA are black. Very few of them are five foot nine Jews. Right? That is not because there is some sort of anti-Semitic conspiracy to keep five foot nine Jews out of the National Basketball Association. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I can't complain that I don't play for the Los Angeles Lakers. Right? This is the, because the reality is that in America, it tends to be just as a general principle, meritocracy rules that's true from the NBA to the halls of academia, and it is certainly true on college campuses. Okay, so let's go through some of the accusations that have been made about white skin privilege. So financial responsibility, right? So she, th this particular author, she said that one of the things that works against you if you're black in the United States is how people perceive your financial responsibility. Okay, first thing to say here, capitalism is colorblind. 
The only color that capitalism cares about is green. Okay, capitalism seriously doesn't care about your color. It doesn't care about your race. It doesn't care about your sexuality. In fact, capitalism is the single best way to overcome racism and sexism and bigotry and homophobia because if you decide to be any of these things, if you decide to be a racist, sexist, bigot, homophobe, the guy next door will not and he will take all of that money from you. You will be outcompeted. This is the beautiful thing about capitalism. Your advantage in the marketplace is catering to as many clients as possible and to hiring the best people possible. But the, 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 the usual statistics that are thrown out are statistics about, for example, lenders systemically or systematically rather discriminating against qualified black borrowers. The truth is that if banks routinely did this, they would go bankrupt, of course, because there would be other banks that came in and spend money on black borrowers and those people would pay back their loans and these banks would be able to make a mint off of all of this. In fact, it turns out that according to a University of Iowa sociologist named Sarah Harkness, she did a study just last year, it turns out that lenders actually discriminate against black males and white women for some reason, or they don't discriminate at all. Right, because her statistical size was, was not big enough. But what she came up with was that black, black women were lent to at the same rate as white men in her experiments, which just doesn't make any sense. This is the, so you, you have to start thinking, is this something that we ought to take seriously or something that we ought to take with a grain of salt? But I will tell you one area in which there was discrimination, and that is the widespread perception that black people were not getting loans led the federal government to create a subprime lending program specifically designated to get people of minority ethnic status into homes they could not afford with bad credit. Okay, if, this had, if it had all been lending discrimination, you would have assumed that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac would have been fine. There would have never been a, a subprime mortgage crisis. In 1995, President Clinton's Housing and Urban Development Department agreed to let Fannie and Freddie get affordable housing credit for buying subprime securities especially particularly with regard to low-income borrowers. So white privilege in the United States extends to the fact that if you, are, if you are not a member of the white privileged class, you have a better shot of getting a subsidized loan from the federal government. And by the way, there are laws on the books in the United States that if you can prove discrimination in lending, you can sue the hell out of these banks. And in fact, banks have had to settle based on historic discrimination. Nothing I'm saying here says discrimination has never existed in America's history. That would be stupid and afactual. But to suggest that it is a continuing factor in American life that is putting people under the boot of the white establishment is just factually nonsense. Okay, style of dress. We talk about white privilege with regard to style of dress. Okay, seriously, this is nonsense. If there, there is no white privilege with regard to style of dress. Because here's the reality. If you sag your pants, if you sag your pants and somebody says to you, pull up your pants and you're a white guy, nobody says a word. If you sag your pants and you're black and somebody says to you, pull up your pants, you will be called a racist. Right? This has actually happened. David Stern, if you remember, who was the, the head of the NBA, he was actually, it was implied and, and actually said in many cases that he was racist for suggesting that people in the NBA ought to dress in nice suits. It turned out that everybody eventually took him up on that, and now NBA players are the best dressed people on planet Earth. But the fact is that style of dress is not an aspect of white privilege. Public speaking skills. They say, well, you know, when it comes to public speaking skills, then white people have an advantage. President Obama is not nearly as articulate as the press would have you believe. Okay, President Obama is not more articulate than John Edwards was, but according to the media, he was the most articulate man who ever lived. He made Jesus look like a piker. President Obama was the greatest speaker in the history of the world. And part of that was because the media gave him affirmative action points. They did. Because if, if anybody said the sort of inarticulate things that President Obama has said routinely when he's off teleprompter, they'd be raked over the coals for it. Job performance, right? They say there's discrimination in job performance, and this is white privilege, right? The fact is that Mizzou has affirmative action in its hiring processes. There are already laws on the books that bar discrimination based on race in hiring. There's already a federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission that investigates charges of racism on a routine basis. It has a program. It's called E-Race, Eradicating Racism and Colorism in Employment. It's designed to fight discrimination against people of color. That is not white privilege. That is the government going out of its way to attempt to fight individual racists and in some cases go beyond the evidence in order to demonstrate racism. The idea that, especially on college campuses, that black folks on college campuses, people of color on college campuses are suffering from some unspecified white privilege, really talk to the Asian guy who has to score 230 points above the black guy in order to get in the same college before you tell me about white privilege. Okay, the fact is that affirmative action programs across the country de facto and and not de, de facto and, and, and in law as well. All of these programs are specifically created in order to get ethnic minority students with lower SAT scores into the building. Okay, if it's white privilege 
to, to, sit, to sit on the side because you can't go to college because the black guy took your slot because he had a lower SAT score, and it, it didn't matter that he, that he grew up rich and you grew up poor. Right? If that's white privilege, then nobody would want to be a member of the white privileged class. Racial profiling and crime, this is the one that you hear the most often. Right? The police are out to get black folks. Without evidence, we keep hearing that white officers shoot black people for no reason whatsoever. This is absolute nonsense. More white people in the United States die at the hands of the cops than black people. More importantly, blacks are more likely to be killed by police than white people on a percentage basis, but police are less likely to kill black people in the same circumstances. According to Professor Peter Moskus of John Jay College of Criminal Justice at CUNY, City University of New York, quote, if one adjusts for the racial disparity in the homicide rate or the rate at which police are feloniously killed, whites are actually more likely to be killed by police than blacks. In other words, if you take a look at the murder rate in the black community, which is significantly higher than the murder rate in the white community, and you use those statistics rather than just general population statistics, what you see is that the cops overrepresent in terms of the number of whites that they kill as opposed to blacks that they kill. How about racial profiling when it comes to speeding? Right? You get this one a lot, driving while black. Well, if you remember back to the 1990s, there was a, a big hubbub. There was a settlement actually from the state of New Jersey in which the state of New Jersey was accused of discriminating against black drivers. Right? Black drivers were, were saying that they were being pulled over for no apparent reason. Well, the Department of Justice and the New Jersey Attorney General commissioned a study, and they clocked the speed of all the drivers. Instead of just assuming that everybody drives at the same speed regardless of race, which again was an evidenceless proposition, they actually went ahead and they looked at how do people drive in the state of New Jersey. Turns out that black people sped disproportionately. Blacks were 25% of all the people speeding and 23% of all the people getting speeding tickets. Right? So the idea that just because there's a disproportionality that is evidence of racism, it's just not true. How about sentencing disparities? I mean, as long as we're myth-busting all of this, how about sentencing disparities? Right? There's this idea out there that black people and white people who commit the same crime, they go to, they go to, they go to jail for different periods of time. Particularly, people like to cite the disparity between crack and powder cocaine sentences. Okay, the fact is that the reason that there is a disparity between crack and powder cocaine sentences is because it is easier to distribute crack, and it is easier to sell crack, and it is easier for people to get high off of crack. And the people who were the moving forces, the moving forces behind the crack powder cocaine disparity were black legislators in inner cities who didn't want people selling crack cocaine in their communities. A majority of black legislators voted in favor of, racial, uh, of disparities in terms of crack versus powder cocaine. As early as 1994, the Justice Department surveyed felony cases in the, in the country's 75 largest urban areas. They found lower felony prosecution rates for blacks than for whites. Actually, uh, the truth is that one of the biggest problems plaguing black communities right now is under-policing, not over-policing. It's not finding people who kill people and putting them in jail. It's not finding serious criminals and putting them in jail. There's a great book called Ghetto Side by a very leftist journalist named Jill Levy. She talks specifically about this. She says that one of the things that is necessary if you want a better, a better lifestyle in inner city black communities is more law enforcement. You need people to feel protected. The reason people aren't investing in Ferguson, Missouri has nothing to do with racism and everything to do with the fact they don't want to have their, sh their store burned down. If you're worried about the, the property crime rates in an area, you're not going to invest in that area. You want to build up those areas. You need more cops, not less, so stop bashing the cops. Okay, poverty, and the idea is that blacks in America are more impoverished than whites because of systemic racism. Okay, according to the Brookings Institute, which is a very left institute, the Brookings Institute has found that if you want to not be permanently poor in the United States, it's actually very easy. This is a wonderful country. If you don't want to be permanently poor in the United States, you need to do three things. Finish high school, get a job, don't get pregnant before you get married. That's it. It, seriously, if you do those three things, you will not be permanently poor in the United States. Would you like to know why there's a disproportionate poverty rate in the black community? Because there is a disproportionate single motherhood rate and dropout rate in the black community. Okay, as much as you, we can talk about white privilege, the fact is that the single motherhood rate in the black community in 1960 was 20%. Today, it is upward of 70%. Unless you are going to argue that racism in the United States has more than tripled in the same period of time that the civil rights movement had its great successes, this is nonsense. And again, there's not a white person anywhere that is forcing a black person to sleep with a black person, conceive a child, and then not get married. It's not happening. It is not, there's not a single place this is happening anywhere in the United States. People, and this is true for, for by the way, white people who are, who are lower, it, it's true across races. It's not just a race-specific thing. Poor white people are people who are having kids out of wedlock and not finishing high school and not getting a job. Right? It's true for everyone. The fact that it's disproportionate in the black community doesn't mean that whites are racist. 
It means that something needs to change inside the black community and people need to start taking personal responsibility. I know these words are out of style. Personal responsibility for the stuff that you do. It is your life. Make something of it. So here's the deal with white privilege. Because white privilege always assumes racism without evidence, always assumes racism about, without evidence, when there is no racism, they simply make up the evidence with regard to white privilege. So here at Mizzou, they just make up the evidence of white privilege. They can't find evidence of white privilege, so what they do is they just make it up. Right? They make up stories about how a poop swastika, which I'm Jewish, okay, swastikas aren't aimed at black people. Okay, a poop swastika <laughs> in, in a bathroom somewhere, this is somehow evidence of a grand racist conspiracy led by Tim Wolf. Right? Okay. <laughs> I wasn't aware that Tim Wolf scrawls poop swastikas in his spare time. When it comes to stories like Jonathan Butler's story about how he was hit by the president's car, he was hit by Tim Wolf's car. If you watch the tape, he was not hit by Tim Wolf's car. There's a thing called video gang, you should use it. Okay, he jumps in front of the car and steps into the car. Okay, he acts like you, like your kid act, or you used to act when you were a kid, and you didn't want to get in trouble for hitting your sibling, so you took your sibling's hand and hit them in the face and said, stop hitting yourself. <laughs> okay, that's what Jonathan Butler did, and then he claimed that he was a victim of systemic racism, thanks to this, and then went on a hunger strike, the answer to which should have been, okay, so starve. <laughs> if you don't want to eat... It's a free country, gang, and if you don't want to eat, it's your own damn problem. <laughs> okay, they make up evidence with regard to things like Michael Brown. Okay, we're still hearing that. We, we heard that here on this campus, that the, this whole big movement here sprang from what happened in Ferguson. Never have I ever heard a better example of how bullshit in one place turns into bullshit in another place. Okay, Michael Brown was a bullshit story from the absolute beginning to the absolute end. Eric Holder's racist Department of Justice found that the shooting of Michael Brown was entirely justified. St. Michael of the gentle giantedness was a thug. He was a criminal. He strong arm robbed a convenience store. He punched a cop. He tried to grab the cop's gun. The gun went off. He then tried to charge the cop according to the testimony of black witnesses in Ferguson. That is why the grand jury did not go forward. So, all, but, but again, if you believe in white privilege and you can't find the evidence, then you just make up the evidence. It's really convenient. This is also true, by the way, with regard to the, the grand crusade that surrounded St. Trayvon of the Blessed Hoodie. Right? The fact is that Trayvon Martin was sitting on top of George Zimmerman by witness testimony and physical evidence, sitting on top of him, banging his head into the ground, breaking his nose, and then George Zimmerman shot him. Okay, it's all there. It was all there when, when, they, when they did the trial. But it turned into another instance of racist white Hispanic people because right, George Zimmerman was actually Hispanic, but he is the first white Hispanic in history, just like Barack Obama is our first white black president because he was half black and half white. George Zimmerman turned into a white Hispanic, the only one that has ever been. And he's like a, 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 he's an endangered species wandering the plains. <laughs> when you make up your own evidence and when you don't have the evidence to back what you're saying, then we end up in this bizarre space, this bizarre, bizarre space where your own subjective truth is what truly matters. Right, what we hear is, well, I may not have the evidence to back it up. I may not have filed a police report. Right? I may not really know that the KKK is wandering around on Mizzou's campus. <laughs> right? I may not know it. I, I don't know, but I feel it. In, deep in my bones, I feel like they're reenacting. <laughs> deep in my bones, they're, they're truly and absolutely reenacting Birth of a Nation out there on the quad. That's what they're doing. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be the truth. It just has to be my truth. It's just my truth. Okay, folks, there's another name for your truth, and it's bullshit, okay? <laughs> the fact is that there is something called truth, and there is something called not truth, okay? There is no such thing as your truth. If it is your truth and you have no evidence to back it up, it is not the truth, it is your feelings. And as I already said, going back 10 minutes, I don't care about your feelings. Your feelings are unimportant. To mature people, the subjective feelings are, of others are only important if you're married to them. Okay, facts don't care about your feelings. So now the, the left collapses to all of this because you know, the left on campus, the administrators, they collapse to all of this because they're on the side of, of a lot of these protesters when it comes to tearing down basic truths about Western civilization. Western civilization to a lot of these administrators uh, who, who cave to all of this, there, there's only two explanations. One is that they're cowards and the other is that they're on the side of the people who are protesting. Uh, cowardice is definitely a plausible explanation for a lot of these folks because they're not used to being 
uh, assaulted this way on a rhetorical level. Um, but there is also a good argument to be made that a lot of these college administrators are people who side with this, with this leftist agenda, this world-changing agenda. These were all the people who protested in the 60s and took over the buildings, and now their grandchildren are eating them. And so, and so they're siding with the protesters because they feel like they're part of the movement because every revolution ends up eating the fathers of the revolution. And so this is just the next logical step in the evolution. And, and, and the foundations of the country you know, are bad, and they, they, they agree Western civilization is a net bad, and because Western civilization is a net bad, anything that tears down basic principles, including free speech, including innocence until proven guilty, until basic standards of evidence and fact, including objective truth, all of these things must be torn down. And if the students are willing to do it, then we're willing to help. Which brings us to the second thing I want to talk about tonight, and that is microaggressions. So when all of your myths about white privilege fall apart, when it turns out the evidence isn't on your side, what do you do? You get sad, right? <laughs> and your sadness leads you to the shocking conclusion that has been discovered by every panty-waist fascist in the history of the world, which is shut up the other side. And the way to shut up the other side is to bloviate about microaggressions. Because once you start talking about microaggressions, then you get to call the guys with the guns. So for those who don't know, what is a microaggression? What is a microaggression? Well, let's use the definition provided by a social psychologist. His name is Jonathan Haidt in The Atlantic. He says, microaggressions are, quote, small actions or word choices that seem on their face to have no malicious intent, but that are thought of as a kind of violence nonetheless. So your subjective perspective on when you have been aggressed is all that counts. You don't actually have to have been aggressed. No, nobody has to have insulted you. But all that matters is that, is that you feel as though you have been aggressed. Now, what Haidt says in The Atlantic, he says that this actually creates unstable people. It actually creates mental illness to push the microaggression culture. He says the recent collegiate trend of uncovering allegedly racist, sexist, classist, or otherwise discriminatory microaggressions doesn't incidentally teach students to focus on small or accidental slights. Its purpose is to get students to focus on them and then relabel the people who have made such remarks as aggressors. You know, in psychology, when people are, are depressed, when they're having, when they're having psychological states. One of the things that they've learned to use is something called cognitive behavioral therapy. The psych majors in the room should know what this is. Right? Cognitive behavioral therapy is the idea that you can actually break the chain of your thought. Right? You, you identify the part in your thought where you went wrong, and then you stop, and then you fix it. Right? But this, the microaggression culture does the opposite. It tells you that everything you feel bad about, it doesn't even have to be true. Somebody has microaggressed you in a way, and thus everything is justified. And so I'm offended now becomes the trump card. Right? My subjective feeling of offense trumps anything that you were saying. It doesn't matter that what you were saying is true. Right? Facts don't care about your feelings, but we're all supposed to care about your feelings more than we care about the facts. And so if I'm microaggressed, a certain privilege attaches to victimhood. Self-appointed victimhood, not even real victimhood. You call yourself a victim. You call yourself microaggressed, and all of a sudden everybody is supposed to collapse in front of you and beg you for forgiveness. And in order to avoid these microaggressions, we create trigger warnings. Right, these idiotic trigger warnings. And, and you know, I promise you that the people who have actually faced down triggers in the field are the last people who would be advocates of the trigger warning nonsense that is pushed on college campuses. Okay, you, you don't need a trigger warning to watch a movie just because you once heard about somebody who was raped. Okay, you don't need a trigger warning to talk about race just because you might be offended. Welcome to America, where people get to say what they want. People acquire fears, by the way, based on these trigger warnings. If you keep telling people that they ought to be afraid, if you keep saying you ought to be afraid, you ought to be afraid, here's a trigger warning, you ought to be afraid, eventually people start to internalize this, and then they start to be triggered, and then they have a feeling of microaggression. It's all a reinforcing, a reinforcing cycle. Now, the beautiful thing about microaggressions is it doesn't just give you an unearned moral superiority over everyone based on your own sense of victimhood. The beautiful thing about microaggressions is the term itself, right? because they're not micro-insults. Right? They're not micro-offensive statements, they're micro-aggressions. The idea being that you have now been aggressed upon, that somebody has done something aggressive to you. And for those of us who live in the real world, the way that aggression is usually met is with aggression. Right? If somebody punches you in the face, you punch them back in the face. Right? But, but what, the, what the term microaggression does is it now violates the cardinal rule from kindergarten, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. The idea being that words will hurt me, and now I can break your bones with sticks and stones. Because words are microaggressions. I have been aggressed upon. Right? It was an act of aggression. It hurt me. And now I get to turn around and do something to you, like call the guys with the guns. And microaggressions become an excuse for violence and racism and, yes, evil. 
It's, it's amazing. In American life, we've, we've become fond of our, our myth of what evil looks like. We've become fond of the kind of James Bond myth of what evil is, where, where evil has now become basically you know, the, the, guy who, who is, um, the, the guy who is at the end of the shadowy table in the James Bond film, uh, and he has a, a shark tank that, that is under the floor, and if he doesn't like you, he hits a button, and then he laughs hysterically. Um, but first he tells you his evil plan so you can escape and kill him later, right? This is what evil is. Evil is this, this myth of, of pure evil. It's just people who enjoy doing evil. Good people, normal people could never turn evil. This is all a myth. It's not true. Okay, there are actual ways that evil is created. And one of the ways that evil is created is through the microaggression culture. Another way that the evil is created is through unjustified self-esteem that is promoted by the left on university campuses. And another way is an ideology of victimhood that results in actual suffering. Okay, this is not coming from me. This is coming from a book called Evil, Inside Human Violence and Cruelty by a Columbia psychologist named Roy Baumeister. What he says is that ideology, clearly, can be a force for evil, because if you believe that the ends justify the means, you're pretty much willing to do anything. Right? If you, if you are, a, if you are a, a Nazi, then you believe that killing Jews gets you to Nazi utopia, so you're basically willing to do anything. Well, if you're somebody who believes that the way that racial justice is done in the country is by getting innocent people fired, you are willing to get innocent people fired in order to pursue racial justice. Ideology trumps decency. Unjustified self-esteem is another way that evil is created. What, what social psychologists have found, what psychologists have found is that people who are violent and do evil things, they're not doing so because of lack of self-esteem. This is nonsense. It's just not true. The, most people who do evil things, most violent people, are people with very high self-esteem, and then who find that their high self-esteem doesn't match up to the reality of the world. And this creates what Baumeister calls ego threats. Ego threats are this gap between how you perceive yourself and what you actually are. And if you spend a lot of time thinking that you are great, and then people tell you that you're not great, then you are likely to respond in a violent way. So all colleges do now is tell kids that they're great. All colleges do is tell kids that they're the future. If that's the case, I'll sell my bonds. All they do is tell kids <laughs> that they are the ones who are going to be running the world, and they're all brilliant, and they're all precious little snowflakes who have to be guarded in their little safe spaces. And if we do that, if we keep them under glass, like, like David Duchovny's hand in Zoolander, then somehow we will come up with a, with a, a better world. We will have created. Uh, a, a better world. What, what, what instead happens is that these kids graduate from college, these, these people not much younger than I am graduate from college, uh, and, they, and they go out and they sit at Occupy protests and they poop on themselves and complain about why their lesbian arts degree isn't getting them a six-figure job on Wall Street. <laughs> and this ends with aggressiveness, and this ends with nastiness, and this ends with bad behavior, which is exactly what Occupy Wall Street ended in. I mean, people were raping each other at Occupy Wall Street protests. People were engaging in acts of violence at Occupy Wall Street protests. And finally, the microaggression mentality. The microaggression mentality. You know, when, when you think of a, a spousal abuser, for example, they, they, they say the difference between a normal husband and a spousal abuser is that if, if, you, if I'm in the car with my wife and my wife says to me, that restaurant, it looks too expensive, we shouldn't go there, then a normal person goes, okay, that restaurant's probably too expensive, we shouldn't go there. The spousal abuser, he says, that's an implicit critique of my earning ability as a man, she deserves a smack in the jaw. Right? That's the microaggression culture at work. I feel offended, even if there was no offense that was meant, and therefore, I can act out in aggressive ways. Microaggression culture actually creates violence. It creates bad behavior because people now feel justified in their bad behavior. There's never been a bad person on planet Earth who has not felt justified in doing his or her bad thing. And all colleges do now is give people reasons to feel like they are justified in doing the bad things that they want to do. Because once you've been microaggressed, once you've been microaggressed, once you're part of the self-designated victim group, driven to extremes, by the evils of white privilege. You can now ban white students from black safe spaces, right? You can, black, you can ban them, which, by the way, is a policy the KKK loves because the space is both separate and equal, <laughs> right? You can, have the, you can call the cops. You can call the cops. You can have the police investigate hateful remarks, as the notice went out from MU a couple of weeks ago. It was heavily covered. I tweeted out that everybody should immediately call the cops and inform them that, that Professor Melissa Click was engaged in microaggressions against people and actual aggressions against people. You can ban reporters from public spaces by calling for muscle. By the way, why Melissa Click is still employed at this university is absolutely beyond me. There is no way in hell anybody should be paying her salary.
Once you're microaggressed, you can deliberately assault reporters, as we saw happen on, to, to at least a couple of reporters. Uh, and, and again, the, I have to tell you, the strategy that, that these protesters are using, this constant you hit yourself strategy, and if you watch the tape of, of the reporter who is trying to get into uh, the safe space, the magical safe space, the, the coveted utopian safe space, um, he's standing there with a the camera, and all of the kids are saying to each other, and, and one of the professors is saying to them, you know, just move up, just move, let's march forward. Let's mar and the, 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 the reporter is literally just standing there. They bump into the reporter with him standing there completely immobile, and then they start yelling at him about how he hit them. And the, the, it's just childish behavior. It's just, this is spoiled brat behavior. You can excuse pastors being punched inside the free speech zone, right? You can do anything. Once you've been microaggressed, microaggression gives you superpowers. And the beauty of it is that you give yourself the superpowers because you're the one who determines whether you've been microaggressed. You don't even have to show proof that you were microaggressed. You were because you feel it deep in the cockles of your heart. <laughs> so finally, all of this, the white privilege, the microaggressions, this provides the impetus for the safe space, the vaunted safe space, which I know I have violated multiple times tonight. And I got to tell you, I don't give two hoots in hell. The, <laughs> And the system is so corrupt, it's so inescapable, and you've made it so corrupt and so inescapable to yourself that when you need a safe space, everybody needs to be put outside the safe space, and reality must not intrude. The South Park song about safe spaces is exactly what these people think. <laughs> and let me tell you something about safe spaces. There's only one group of people, one group of people, who want safe spaces that are race-specific. There are only one group of people that want safe spaces so that they never have to hear from anybody of a different ideology or political persuasion. Those people are called fascists. Okay, and you've got a bunch of fascists, damn fascists on this campus, who are trying to shut down political debate and trying to cloister themselves in this little cocoon of stupidity so they don't have to debate anyone or think about issues outside their kin so that they can feel comfortable. Guess what? Life isn't about feeling comfortable. Life is about bettering yourself. Get off your ass, you stupid pansies. <laughs> Every fascist in the history of the world has his safe space. Every fascist has his safe space. It's terrible for you. It's terrible for this university. It's terrible for the country. Grow the hell up. You're in a safe space, thank God. It's called America. Learn to appreciate it or get out. I'm happy to take questions. Thanks so much. I don't all rush forward at once. Yeah. <laughs> it can be about anything. It doesn't have to be about me ranting at people. Uh, by, if by open form it means you get to make a speech, the answer is no. There has to be a question mark at the end. Yeah, just question. So um, a, lot in a lot of these social justice circles, you know, a lot of them lie on the left of the left of the aisle, they believe in these uh, you know, social justice causes. But in a lot of these really super liberal countries in Europe, such as like Sweden, France, Belgium, you see a, a lot of covering for a lot of the more problematic and radical, radicalized beliefs of Islam, like, um, such as like... No, I read you. I read you. Yeah. Okay. And this kind of goes back to the video you made about a year ago about the myth of the tiny radical... Uh, Muslim, yeah, the, the, the tiny radical Muslim minority, yeah. So why do you think that liberals are so quick to uh, sort of judge uh, imagined racism in white people and white Americans, yet they seem to cover for it in uh, Islam? Yes, this is a good question. It is a good question. So the, the question is for people who, I mean, we have a mic, so I assume everybody heard it, but the basic question was, why is it that the left seems so comfortable siding with radical Islam in so many situations around the world? And the answer is because leftist philosophy is based on the philosophy of the oppressed versus the oppressor. Right? The way that the left judges the world is based on equality of outcome. All that matters is that everybody ends up equal. It doesn't matter equal opportunity. Leftism is based on the fundamental premise that everybody should end up the same. So if there are two guys in a room, one guy has $4 and one guy has $1, the guy with four must have exploited the guy with one. Or if there's a homeless guy and Bill Gates, Bill Gates must have exploited the homeless guy somehow, even if the homeless guy can't afford a crappy version of Windows. Right? He must have exploited him. Well, the same holds true internationally. So if you look internationally, Islamic countries tend to be incredibly poor because they're badly run and because they're oppressive and because they're tyrannical. And because all of that is true, these countries do not do well on the international stage. The left, however, just sees impoverished country, super wealthy America, super wealthy West, 
Western civilization must have made them poor through colonialism and imperialism. Therefore, we owe some sort of blood guilt on this. And so we have to be warm toward, a, toward, toward what are essentially philosophies of people who are, who are, who are impoverished. This is, so the, the left believes that, that ideology, religious ideology, is basically just a, a, a sheer cover on poverty. Right? The only reason that, that radical Muslims are radical is not because of radical Islam. They're radical Muslims because, they're, because, they, are, because they are poor. And so if we could just rectify that situation, everything would be hunky-dory. That's, that's why they're so warm. They, they side with the oppressed versus the oppressor, and the oppressed are always the people who are poor, even if the oppressed are actually the oppressors and killing people. What would you suggest the best way for those of us who dissent against the views and methodology yes, of sir. the concerned student movement to sorry, you know, try and sorry. combat this change that's occurring in our student body and just <laughs> like, campuses across America? Well, I think that the, the most potent thing that concerned students have done is they pu pushed a language that we have refused to fight. So that they say things, that they, they spout tautologies like racism exists. I agree. That was one of my fundamental premises at the beginning, right? Racism on an individual level definitely exists, of course. You'd be a fool to deny it. And then they say, okay, well, because they're individuals who are racist, everything is racist. You have to reject the logic. You have to, you have to call on them to show evidence. And you need some people with backbone. I mean, really, this is a, we, we now live in a country where the ultimate the ultimate argument ender is you're a racist, right? This is basically how everybody is silenced. Tim Wolf is a racist. He's a racist. How do we know he's a racist? Because he's a white guy, which is racist, right? They, they, it is, by the way, it is, it is totally incredible to me that Tim Wolf is supposed to be this great beneficiary of white privilege, but your football coach, who gets paid $3.1 million a year and is a white guy, right? He's not a beneficiary of white privilege because he sides with concerned student 1950. Right? He's a good guy, so he, he's, not, he's not a white privilege guy, or at least he recognizes his white privilege. But Tim Wolf has to lose his job. Right? So the, the answer is that you ha the sophistry of the left has no impact unless you internalize it. If you just refuse to accept the narrative that they are pushing, there's nothing they can do to you. What would have happened at this university if Tim Wolf had looked at Jonathan Butler and said, okay, so what? Right, really, what, if, what would have happened? What would have happened if he, if, he had looked at, if he had said to Jonathan Butler, you stepped into my car? Right? If he said to Jonathan Butler, every racist incident that was reported to the police was fully investigated as appropriate under local, state, and federal law, which is true. Okay, if he had said that and Jonathan Butler had kept hunger striking, do I think Jonathan Butler was going to die for his beliefs? I think mommy and daddy, who are worth $20 million, would probably have bought him a popsicle. <laughs> I'm with the Mizzou CRs. I'm doing questions online, so these are going to be from Twitter. Um, so David R. Shorten at D. Shorten Music wants to know, um, <laughs> uh, in the ideological war between left and right, what are the strongest weapons on both sides? Well, the strongest weapon for the left is always character attacks, right? You're a racist, sexist, bigot, homophobe. That's the only, it's actually the only argument that they have, generally speaking. They disagree with you, therefore you're a bad person. Right, this is what basically Barack Obama said this with regard to anybody who objects to his Syrian refugee idea. Right? You're a bad person, you hate children, you hate women, you fear widows, right? you're, you're a bad person. We can't actually have a logical discussion about the issue, you're just a bad person. That's the strongest argument on the left side. The strongest argument on the right side, presumably, which is why I'm on the right, is, is evidence and logic. The problem is that in an argument, evidence and logic actually tend to lose to character assault. Character assault tends to win. Because once you've been labeled a racist, no one wants to hear your, your evidence and your argument. And so, as I have frequently said, the, the biggest mistake that people on the right make is that when they are called a racist, sexist, bigot, homophobe, they then, they then proceed to try and have a normal conversation with the person who labeled them this. Right? The proper answer to you're a racist is not, you know what, let's have a discussion about race in America. The proper answer to you're a racist is, no, you're an a-hole. Because, it is, because, for, because for somebody to call you a racist without evidence is an a-hole thing to do. Right? You, you are not supposed to just drop character charges on people without any evidence of any sort. You're supposed to be able to back it up. So the right needs to start using that argument. It's effective, I know from personal experience. Uh, and it is, and it is a, a useful tool. Because until we can get to the point where the left and the right actually have discussions about policy and not about character, nothing is going to happen that's good in American politics. Of this university, I don't really have a question for you because I agree with most of what you say. I just wanted to say thank you for coming and helping us fight the fight here. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank everybody for showing up honestly and, and, and being willing to stand up in the face of overwhelming 
media jackassery because it, it, <laughs> I mean, I'm a frequent watcher of ESPN, which has now become basically MSNBC with footballs. <laughs> I was driving around campus today and, uh, and not seeing bodies in the streets of, of poor black children and not, seeing, and not seeing the Ku Klux Klan on campus riding their white stallions and, and not seeing Bull Connor anywhere with a hose. I was kind of surprised because if you had watched the media coverage from, uh, from outside this particular space, the impression that you got is that racism is endemic to the university. It is everywhere. And the, the cowardly administration that refuses to defend the university or itself backed into this by basically saying that, yes, yes, we're racist, yes, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, right? We, 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 must be, we must be racist, now please leave us alone, and then cowering in a corner like scared little girls. It's, if, that, if that were the impression that, that you got from the university, that's because of the media. So thank you for coming out today, because this is, I, I, honestly, I think this is the first time that the, U, that the Mizzou community has shown that not everybody agrees with this nonsense, fascistic, tyrannical movement that's being pushed by the left. Give yourselves a hand, honestly. Hi, I'm Josh Ferry. Um, I have a lot of questions for you, so if you want to come over for Shabbat dinner, oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so, as a Jew, I obviously experience, you know, racism from time to time. I mean, unless somebody had a really bad day at dining hall, that poop swastika was meant for people. Um, so, for, for somebody like me who obviously sometimes agrees with what's happening on campus, not in the sense of how it's being taken care of, but the fact that, yes, I agree, like you said, there is racism here and there. Sure. So, as somebody who believes that and who strongly supports Israel and its right to exist and stuff like that, how do you suggest dealing with activists like on campus, you know, these Black Lives Matter groups and other groups? aligning themselves with like BDS movements and boycotting mm -hmm. Israel movements, where when I sometimes agree with them, but then they do that, I'm like, whoa. Well, I mean, I, 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 I want more specifics on where you agree with them. But, um, the, <laughs> uh, but as far as the, the, uh, the alliance between you know, all of these various ethnic groups that are kind of getting together and then backing each other's play in order to tear down the system, I mean, there's a reason. It's an alliance. They're, they're using, I mean, this, this actually has deep roots. In, in certain leftist philosophy, there's a school of thought called the Frankfurt School. It's a Marxist school of thought that came to the United States in the 1920s and 1930s. They were expatriates from Germany. And they had realized that the Marxist description of the world, that the oppressed classes, the, the, that the, the poor of the world, the proletariat, were going to rise up and take over the universe, all this was not true in the aftermath of World War I. And so they had to come up with a different strategy for how to make this happen. And one of the things that they suggested was polarize people along tribal lines, along racial lines, and then have everybody sort of attack the capitalist system as the source of all racism. And so you're seeing that alliance in action right now. I mean, that's, that's really what you're seeing because, for goodness sake, I mean, forget the Black Lives Matter movement for a second. Think about the bizarre juxtaposition between the, the boycott, divest, sanctions movement against Israel and the LGBT crowd. Right? I mean, talk about something that makes no sense whatsoever, right? I mean, they, they, they literally kill gay people. In certain, in certain parts of the Middle East, and there's actual legal punishment for homosexuality under the Palestinian Authority. But yet, the LGBT crowd will side with the anti-Israel crowd. That, that's because there's a broader agenda, not because they agree on every particular. The only way to fight that is by calling it out when you see it, uh, and, and not caving to this generalized idea that America is a terrible, oppressive, terrible place. Honestly, the people at this university, and through, we are privileged to live at such a time in history. You know, for all the problems that I have with, with the current administration, and for all the problems I have with the American left and the international left, and for all the skepticism I have about the future, this is, if you could live in any time of history, it would be right now. I mean, living right now is a magnificent thing. And living in America right now is the best any group of human beings has ever had it in the history of the world. And so having people rip down the system that built all of that, saying, oh, yeah, we'll make things better by taking away all of the fundamental notions of freedom and liberty that, that undergird that, that truly is an evil goal. My name is Victoria. I'm a freshman journalism student here. Um, I actually have two questions for you. Um, I'm in a class right now where our entire grade is based off of papers we have to write, specifically dealing with issues like how white privilege has affected marginalized groups of people over, like, Cross throughout natural. history. Uh -huh. Yes, something specific like that. It's not the journalism class, but how would you uh, suggest, like, somebody, like, for me, for example, who believes that, you know, it's kind of bullshit. It's when in the face that my entire grade is based off of right. doing something like this. And also, uh, I saw you on the Dr. Drew show a few months ago when Zoe Tur put 
their hand on the back of your neck, and it I is, wanted yes. to know what happened with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, you don't have to get in trouble. I'll do it. Uh, so the. <laughs> Uh, so, so, for, so the first, okay, so the first answer as to should you sacrifice your grades in order to write correct things on your test? The answer is no. Don't sacrifice your grades. If you were to dig up my blue books from UCLA, 15 years ago, you would find that I wrote like Lenin, because in <laughs> because in class I would speak up, but then all of the tests were anonymous. I, I never suggest to any student that they sacrifice their grades and their academic future on the altar of doing the right thing, because you're not going to get any points for it. Nobody's going to know about it, uh, and and. These teachers, the, the intolerant ones, do have your grades in their hands and, to a certain extent, your future in their hands. Uh, as far as the Zoe Tur incident, for people who, who didn't see this and don't know what she's referring to, it's kind of a fun story, so I'll tell it. Uh, so, so <laughs> story time with Ben Shapiro. So about, about three months ago, you can find this online. Uh, it, go to YouTube. It's, it was a very big story at the time. It was like the number one trending topic on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, it was, it, so the, I, I was invited to go on CNN Headline News on the Dr. Drew Show. And I was invited to talk about how Caitlyn Jenner, was Caitlyn Jenner a hero or not? This is when ESPN was giving Caitlyn Jenner the Hero Award. You know, rather than soldiers who had had limbs blown off and continued their athletic careers, right? No, Caitlyn Jenner was a hero for being an extraordinarily wealthy white man with a mental disorder. And, the, and so they knew my opinion on this, obviously. I'd written about it. I'd spoken about it. And my belief, I, I, there's something I like, and it's called science. And science suggests that if you have if you have not a single cell in your body without a Y chromosome, except for your sperm cells, and if you still have all your appendages, and if you still have your twig and berries and all the rest of it, but you call yourself a woman, no. No. And this goes back to my feeling that your subjective view of yourself is completely irrelevant to me. I don't care what you think you are. I just care what you are. Uh, and, uh, and so you know, they, knew what, what was, they knew what I was going to say. I'd made this very clear. The producer of the Dr. Drew Show, who happens to be a former producer, he told me, uh, Jerry Springer, uh, decided that it would be a wise idea to, to have on, to debate me, uh, a guy by the name of Zoe Turr, who is a transgender woman, is a post-op transgender woman, uh, and is a he, because he is still a he. You can, you can lose the parts, and you are still a man. Okay? So, they, so they, they decide to seat the two of us next to each other. And so we're seated next to each other, and, the, and this debate starts, and everybody's talking about, is Caitlyn Jenner a hero, or is Caitlyn Jenner not a hero? And, uh, and finally, they come to me, and I said, I don't understand why we are engaging in mass delusion. Right? Well, why are we doing the emperor's new clothes bit? All right, we all know Caitlyn Jenner's a man, and we're sitting here pretending Caitlyn Jenner's a woman. And at one point, I said to one of the guys on the panel, would you date Caitlyn Jenner? Right, you're a straight guy. Would you date Caitlyn Jenner? And the answer, of course, is no, because Caitlyn Jenner still has a penis. Okay? <laughs> it's the most feminine penis you've ever seen. And it's, and uh, and so you know I say and so I you know I say this and uh, microaggressions everywhere and uh, <laughs> and I run, and just as I say microaggressions lead to actual aggression. So what happened is I, I said this and the, this transgender guy sitting next to me he grabs me by the back of the neck uh, on national TV and says if you don't cut that out you'll go home in an ambulance or I'll send you home in an ambulance, which is weird because ambulances don't go home. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so I was taken aback slightly uh, and, uh, to have this, this guy who was speaking. What, 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 pre what precipitated it is there was a point where he had said, you don't understand genetics. And I said, what are your genetics, sir? And it was the sir that got to him. And so, uh, and so in a voice at least two octaves lower than mine, he growled at me, you know, I'll send you home in an ambulance. <laughs> And, uh, and what was amazing about the experience was that the, uh, everybody on the panel, every, universally on the panel, everybody turned on me after a threat of physical violence and an actual legal battery on national television. Uh, they turned on me. Uh, how you knew that was going to be offensive, didn't you? You knew that was going to be offensive. To which I said, I don't care. <laughs> right? That's not, uh, my job is not to be inoffensive. My job is to tell the truth. I mean, you had me on this program to say exactly this. Uh, well, the, the, the outcome of this is that I went and, uh, and did what, I, I, really mostly to make the point that you're not supposed to be able to get away with this stuff, uh, I went and I filed a police report for battery. Um, and, uh, and I did so because after the, during the break, Zoe tur turned to me and said, I'll see you in the parking lot. They'd send security out to the outdoors with me. They'd send him up to my car. He was threatening me on Twitter, saying well, he would curb stomp me, et cetera. Um, and, um, but it, which I have to say is deeply unladylike behavior. <laughs> Thank you. 
And, um, and so the, the end result was that it goes from the police to the DA. It finally gets to the DA. And, uh, and the DA says that we can't, uh, this fact pattern we can't do, I mean it's on video, but this fact pattern we can't do anything because the person, who, uh, the person who assaulted you essentially, the person who committed battery upon you is a member of a victimized minority essentially. There is no doubt, none, that if I had, if I had been the one who grabbed Zoe Tur by the back of the neck and threatened to send him home in an ambulance, that I certainly would have been given some sort of probation. There's no question about it. I've talked to multiple police officers in the LAPD and they assure me this is the case. Jackson, and I followed you on Twitter after seeing that on ESPN, and one of the best decisions of my life. <laughs> uh, my question to you has... You need more stuff in your life, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, my question to you is about the Syrian refugee mm -hmm. immigration, and what your opinion on that is, even though we have roughly, I believe, 50,000 homeless vets. Yeah, I mean, the, the fact is that, for me, it's not even a matter of the number of people coming in, because in a free market economy, you know, all that does is just lower the price of labor. So it's, it's, I don't think it's a matter of straining our, it, it, I shouldn't say that. It is a matter of straining our social services, but that is not my primary concern. I have two primary concerns when it comes to the Syrian refugees. One is obviously the fact that we can't screen them. And despite the Obama administration's protestations, that yes, we have beautiful vetting procedures. Right? The same vetting procedures that got you Major Anita Hassan, the same vetting procedures that got you the Chattanooga Tennessee shooter, the same vetting procedures that got you the Sarnia brothers, Right? All of these vetting procedures, they say that they're going to do biometric scans, which are completely useless unless you actually have physical evidence of these people committing criminal acts elsewhere. Right? You have nothing to scan them against. It's like saying they're going to fingerprint these folks. Well, unless you have fingerprints at a crime scene somewhere else, that doesn't make any difference. They say that they're going to interview them. What does that interview look like? I mean, really, what is that? they say apparently the, per the people doing the interviews have eight days of training on Syria, and then they're thrown right in. Uh, they say that they're going to do background checks. By calling whom? Who do you actually call? You call Bashar Assad and ask him for, for, his, for his information. <laughs> right? There's, they, it's, so it's nonsensical. People on Homeland Security Committee know this is nonsensical. The, the, today, the House passed a bill curbing Syrian immigration after Homeland Security came and made a presentation. They actually lost votes after the for Homeland Security presentation. So that's one issue. The other issue is, what is the nature of the immigrants that you're bringing in, period? And this is not a religious issue, it's a values issue. Are the people who you're bringing in going to make the country a better place, or are they going to make the country a more polarized place? Do they have any experience with Western-style democracy? Do they believe in any of the same American rights that we believe in, or not? And that's a very relevant question to ask about any immigrants and any class of immigrants. Now, do I think it's stupid to say you're not going to bring in five-year-old orphans? Yes, I think that's dumb. But do I think that it's, that it's not stupid to say you ought to look at the values of the people that you're bringing in? I would say that about people of any religion. And the fact is that when you're talking about people who are coming from a place like Syria, which has no history of democracy, no history of human rights, no history of basic American rights, like freedom of speech, no idea of what equality of the sexes looks like, there's going to be a culture clash. Look at Europe. Europe is full of culture clash because of the vast wave of Muslim immigration. So on those two, on those two levels, I'm extremely worried about the Syrian refugee wave. And by the way, question for the Ummah, right, the, the Muslim nation that is supposed to take everybody in. There are a billion Muslims on planet Earth and there are 52 Islamic majority countries on planet Earth. None of you have room for these folks? None of you? Right, Turkey is taking in about 2 million of them. 15% are still in refugee camps. The truth is that the Ummah has a pretty poor record of taking in refugees. Right, for, all, for all the talk about how it's the Israelis who are victimizing the Palestinians, for example, there are still, 70 years later, 10 refugee camps in Jordan. There are 13 refugee camps full of Palestinians in Syria. There are refugee camps in the south of Lebanon. Four Palestinians, two generations after the creation of Israel. By contrast, Israel has taken in every wave of Jewish refugees that has ever existed. So, the, so you know, I, I'm, I, I'm getting tired of hearing the, the sort of unearned moral superiority of the Muslim world when it comes to, oh, you Westerners, you have to take our refugees. Obama won in 2008 and 2012. Mm -hmm. Do you see uh, Ted Cruz going after Carl Quintanilla at the CNBC debate as a change, as the, the yes. Republicans starting to wake up? I thought it was great. I think that my view is that, and I've said this before, if Republicans have a choice between winning the 2016 election and totally destroying the media where it stands, I would absolutely pick the latter. Uh, the, the mainstream media is a disaster area. They are, they are corrupt from top to bottom. Uh, and, and I'm glad, that the, and the truth is their corruption can only exist on the back of Republican stupidity. Because it's Republicans who go on these shows and then give them the, the patina of legitimacy that they don't deserve. 
right? It's Republicans who go on. I mean, what was amazing to me is when the George Stephanopoulos stuff started to break. Oh, George Stephanopoulos gave lots of money to the Clinton Foundation. I remember sitting there being like, wait, he was their chief of staff. Like, why is this a shock? Why is this taking him down? Nobody, nobody realized this for the last 20 years? Um, and the reason is because Republican, there's sort of a collective action problem in that Republicans who want to go on TV go to places like ABC News and they say, I want to be on TV and I'm happy to treat George Stephanopoulos really well and pretend he's objective in order to get on TV. So John McCain will do that. If Republicans en masse just started saying to people at the top of interviews, not, this isn't even to be mean, this is just real. I'm a conservative, you're a leftist, that's my bias, your bias is now clear, let's have a conversation. It would totally change the tenor of the debate. There's a reason CNN and MSNBC don't like to have me on, because I actually do this. <laughs> I mean, there, there's multiple videos of me doing this to various... I did it to HuffPost Live last week, right? Because, it, because people's biases matter. No one is unbiased. And the so-called objective media is, is... It doesn't exist. I thought what Cruz did was great. Uh, I think the, the Republicans should keep it up. And if they don't keep it up, they're going to lose. Thank you. Hi, Matthew. Uh, <laughs> um, so, Bling at Anime Snob 25. <laughs> <laughs> Wants to know, this is a really good question though, um, do you feel the majority of concerned student 1950 are truly devious or just misguided? I think most people are misguided. Just on planet Earth, I think most people are misguided. I think that there, I think there, are, I think there, are, there are leaders at concerned student 1950 who are, who are devious. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, but at a certain point, ignorance becomes sin. And when you do this long enough and you're victimizing enough innocent people, the, the only innocent person who was actually victimized in this whole debacle was Tim Wolf, who didn't do anything, and is a white guy who lost his job for being a white guy. Uh, and, uh, and if you were part of that, you should feel ashamed of yourself. You really should, because he didn't do anything to have that coming. He really didn't. So, you know, the, do I think they're devious? Do I think, that they're, do I think that they're just fellow travelers? In the end, I'm not sure that it really matters. Disassociate yourself from people who do bad things, or you're going to be lumped in with them. It's the, that's just the way life works. University of Central Missouri CRs. Um, and I was just wondering, as a conservative black student, how do you feel that I should go about? <laughs> right. <I know. laughs> I'm a woman also, crazy, right? <laughs> how should I go about voicing my political views and values without being attacked by people who say that I'm not black enough or I don't fit in either way. Yeah, I mean, the, the racism of the left is truly clear when you talk about black conservatives. I mean, everybody is black enough, unless they're Ben Carson, in which case they're not black enough, or Colin Powell, when he was a Republican. It was amazing how Colin Powell switched from being not black enough to be the blackest guy on earth the minute that he started supporting President Obama. All the questions just disappeared magically. Um, it's, you know, the, the, when you ask, how do you avoid the attack? The answer is you can't. And one of the things that I tell all conservatives all over America, is conservatives have a tendency to just kind of want to live our lives. You know, I have a wife, I have a kid. I do this for a career, but the truth is in my off time, I don't like talking politics because it's my off time. Uh, and, and when I turn on ESPN and I see politics, I actually get deeply annoyed and upset because you know, it, it, feels like the, it feels like the assault is, is nonstop and all out. Uh, and that's true, I think, for, for conservatives all over the country. Uh, my, one of my mentors was, was Andrew Breitbart. And Andrew was fond of saying that you have to walk toward the fire that you just have to embrace it. You have to embrace you're going to be called these names. And there's something deeply empowering about the idea that once you're called the name and just bounces off of you, it's, it's, it's like you've discovered a magic shield. You, once someone says that you're not black enough and you just say, no, you're just completely full of shit, then, it's, then it's, there's nothing they can do to you. What can they do to you? There's nothing they can do to you. You have to believe it in your own heart. You have to start questioning your own values and your own systems of thought for that to have any impact on you. So you know, be strong, be of good, be of good cheer, and, and understand that people who are your political enemies are out to get you, and they will get you by any means possible, and they are not honest, and they, are, and, and they do say nasty things, but, they, but what they have is a weapon that, that has no power to it. Once you, once you realize that, it's a, it's a very, very empowering feeling. To, uh, you had me in until you, you brought up Caitlyn Jenner for no reason and um, called her a man. Uh, well, it was yes, so it wasn't okay. for no reason. Um, I want to know why uh, you think that the conservative media is picking up on this story so much, whereas um, the liberal media 
doesn't has not been reporting on this to the extent that you guys did. Um, full disclosure, I, I did um, talk on to Brie Bart's um, Alex uh, Strassel. Um, uh huh. Uh huh. Yes, yeah, some of our reporters, Brett, right? Yeah. Yep. And 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 that that interview was a mistake. Um, but uh, I, I do want to know why you think that. Why the imbalance? Do you think that the conservative media is using this to push their uh, agenda? Uh, yes, and it's a factual agenda. So, yes, I mean, it, of course. I mean, this is a, a, like, I'm not going to pretend that. Um, I, I, I'm honest enough to acknowledge that everybody has a bias. And so, obviously, people tend to push stories that back their points of view. It just so happens that this story backs the true contention that folks on the left want to shut down free speech and are not particularly interested in it when it conflicts with what they want. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, there's a reason the left isn't going to pay attention to it, because it cuts against what they want to say. The left wants to say that, that offensiveness is a significantly more important, uh, being non-offensive is a more important value than free speech. This is what they want to say. Uh, and, and the right says free speech is a more important value than non-offensiveness. So in that battle, your video was a perfect example of free speech. Of, it, was, it was a clarifying moment. It was, it was a clarifying moment for a lot of people who saw that for the left, non-offensiveness is more important than, than freedom of speech. Well, I mean, I can, I can tell you that, that Professor Click has become a meme in, in conservative circles. She has become the face of the American left fascist movement uh, with, her, with, her, with her, you know, pointing at you to get out and calling for muscle against you. So, uh, you know, the idea that, that so, so there, I don't think that the story is over for Professor Click. Uh, as far as the coverage of Tim Wolf, the reason that yours went viral is because this, this actually does not have to do with conservative versus left. There's just a difference between video and no video. Video is something people can watch. It's something people can share. This is why, folks, if you actually want to make a difference in the world, you all have cell phones. You're all journalists now. Congratulations. Go out, get a story. You can break it. It can become a big thing like this. Right? So that's, that's really the moral of the story. So, Ben, we've got 7,000 concurrent viewers right now. Awesome. Oh, yeah, well, welcome to all the concurrent viewers. Question. The, the liberal media knows they're wrong. They're ashamed of it. That's why they're not covering it. Um, I want to say uh, I don't think um, you should fake, uh, you should pretend to be something, to write something you don't believe on a test. Because you say no one will know, but you'll know, and you won't have a clear conscience then. So um, it, this is a question of methodology versus, versus, I mean, this is a question. For me, I would rather that you lie on your test, get straight A's. Go to Harvard Law School, get out, make a lot of money, turn around and use your multi millions of dollars to destroy all the people who, who crushed you. <laughs> I don't think that any justify the means, and I think the value of your type conscience is more valuable than the Okay, that's fine. We can have an honest disagreement about this. Uh, that's we, we have the same um, goal as just different. No, I understand. We can have an honest disagreement about that. I understand your perspective. I just think as a general rule, it's a mis there are certain people in control of the university system, and ignoring that is, is a dangerous thing for a lot of folks. I would say you touched on the solution earlier. You say uh, when you participate in a corrupt system, you legitimize it. So I would say uh, walk away. Well, I mean, so... The, so uh, the, don't go on it. Don't go right, so, okay, so as far as walk away, I think that the real answer is, is not on the college campuses. The real answer uh, is in the employment community. The idea that everybody has to go to college is, is just a, is a, is an idiocy that's been foisted upon us over the last 30, 40 years. And the reality is that college has basically become just a sorting mechanism, right? The, the, the fact is that if you go to a top college, now we know you're smart. And so you can get a good job because we know you're smart. You have a degree in political science, which is totally useless for all intents and purposes. I was a poli sci major, I know. Um, and so, yeah, so are you. So you're useless too. Uh, and, <laughs> and, right, it, so, it's, so the, 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 point, the point being that the college system itself is deeply corrupt and problematic, and so there needs to be an alternative system built. I agree with that, and I think that one of the things that should happen, and I think is going to start happening, is with the rise of the internet, I think you're going to start seeing internet universities where people can actually get educated. Uh, I think that you know, there, there are a lot of conservatives who send their kids to Hillsdale College. I think it's actually a useful thing, I do, for conservative students to go to leftist universities just so that you know what the other side is thinking. I think conservatives get more out of being on a campus like this than leftists do. I think the leftists on campus get nothing out of being on campus other than their, their happy little 
unicorn and, and puppy dog filled safe space. My question is, do you think we're living in, do you think uh, we're living in the end times? I like, think uh, we're living in the end times, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do. Uh, okay, well, we'll have to disagree on that one too. Uh, do I think, you know, uh, I, I don't foresee the asteroid coming. Um, so uh, you, I may pray for it before the next election, but uh, <laughs> the sweet meteor of death, 2016. Um, but, uh, but no, I, I don't think that we are living in the end times. I'm not an apocalyptic thinker. Uh, speaking of next election, this question really is unrelated, but yeah. I'm just curious who you think is the best president for America. Uh, the, the guy who I think would be the best president is Ted Cruz. Uh, the, uh, and I, I like a number of the Republican candidates. You know, I, I like Ted Cruz. I like Marco Rubio. I think he's wrong on immigration. Um, I, but... Honestly, I would take a flaming bag of dog feces over Hillary Clinton. Uh, so it's not. There's a very, very strong case to be made for an inanimate object as president. Everything would be pocket vetoed, no new programs. Everything would sunset. It would be, it would be good. The only thing you would need is, is you know, just a mechanical hand to sign defense spending bills. Um, but, but other than that, you know, so it's, it, but I think there are a lot of, there are a lot of good candidates who would be good presidents. Then there are some candidates who I think would be mediocre presidents, but better than Hillary Clinton, um, because that's just a truism. Anyone will be better than Hillary Clinton, except for Barack Obama. Uh, and so, um, you know, that the, the usual follow-up question is, who do you think can win, right? Who, who do you think can beat Hillary Clinton? And I think it almost totally depends on the news cycle. I think that right now, if the election were today, any of the Republicans could beat Hillary Clinton, because as long as the news cycle is that there is a foreign threat that is a grave threat to the United States, Democrats lose. The, the typical p political narrative in the United States has been Democrats saying the greatest threat to America is Republicans, and Republicans saying that the greatest threat to America is some foreign power, Soviet Union, China, Russia, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, right? And so when the American people believe that a foreign threat is the greatest threat, they vote Republican. When they believe Republicans are the greatest threat, they vote Democrat. Uh, and this is why Hillary Clinton, for example, in that, in that first soporific Democratic debate, said that her enemies were the Republicans, right? Because she actually believes that. I think that Republicans should start basically saying the opposite. I think Republicans should recognize the truth, which is the truth is that the greatest threat to the continued power and prosperity of the United States is the Democrats. It's not ISIS. Um, because the fact is that it's the Democrats that make ISIS possible. So you know, we're the most powerful country in the history of mankind. It doesn't just go away overnight because you have a few barbarians at the gates. You actually have to weaken the internal structure of the country before the barbarians can enter the gates. Hi, my name is Ethan, and uh, I just wanted to say a damn. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, the only thing more important uh, in our culture today than speaking the truth without expletives is just speaking the truth, period. So <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. I have two questions. I'll try and keep them short. Um, with the football team kind of you know boycotting their activities uh, until team, yeah. uh, Tim Walker resigned, I'm not sure how much of a sports commentary you are. Um, they suck. What? They're five and five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you know, with with their boycott and then Pinkle's subsequent endorsement of that, um, although it wasn't. Uh, I believe, like a, a big impetus in Tim Wolf resigning. Uh, what kind of precedent do you think that sets for other, uh, let's just say, revenue-producing groups on campus to basically extort their administration? Yeah, no, I, I, so I mean, I've, I've written a column. I think the college sports should basically go the way of the dodo bird. I don't understand why you're giving academic scholarships to people who have no intention of fulfilling their academic criteria, who see the scholarship as not enough and want to be paid. It's an academic institution. I don't know how these two things got linked. I mean, we all enjoy going to football games, but that's why I pay for NFL Sunday. Right? I mean, this is the, the idea that taxpayers, especially at state-sponsored universities, at state-sponsored universities, taxpayers are supposed to pay a portion of a salary that's $3.1 million in order so that you can have a football team for a bunch of people who, again, are going to major in phys ed is just... It, it, it's, it's nonsensical to me. It, just, it doesn't make sense as an academic institution, uh, and, and it demonstrates where the, the real power base at these universities lies, which is, which is kind of pathetic. And by the way, I do want to mention, that, but before we go further, just because I promised I would, the, 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 the Mizzou CRs, for people who are watching also, the Mizzou CRs uh, do have a GoFundMe page to fund future programming here. They need your money and they need your help, so go to their, their GoFundMe page and search for University of Missouri College Republicans and give them some money, because they could use it. They're obviously in over their heads here. <laughs> My second question is this. Uh, obviously, in the news, there have been a number of uh, racist incidents around campus mm -hmm. um, that have been uh, kind of blown out of proportion by you know, groups like Concerned Student to right. 
you know, be it's indicative. everybody. It's everybody. Yeah, it, it's you know, it's being blown out of proportion to be indicative of this you know racist system. Um, I was wondering how much you think uh, the substance abuse cult substance abuse culture, which is also uh, just as prevalent on college campuses. I was wondering how much you think uh, that's behind these isolated incidents. And like, how, if at all, should we combat that? And what effect? Would okay, so have? I guess the, the question is, you know, is this all because of drunken lechery? Uh, <laughs> and uh, and no, I, I think that a racist who gets drunk is a racist, and a non-racist who gets drunk doesn't magically become a racist. I mean, I think racists are racists. Uh, if it, I also think that on a on a university campus of what? What do you have? Thirty thousand, thirty-five thousand students here, uh, and, and a campus of this size it would be shocking if you had no racist incidents. Uh, ac across that campus, because it's, it's a big crowd. I mean, the racist incidents happen. Now, the question is, what does the system do about it? And in this case, the system didn't do anything wrong about it. You know, I've been walking to synagogue, and when I walk to synagogue, I'm dressed exactly like I am now. I wear a suit, and I wear my yarmulke. Uh, and, and when I walk to synagogue, you know, I've, I've had incidents where people drive past me in a car and shout anti-Semitic slurs. I didn't call for the, the mayor of Los Angeles, where I live, to resign. <laughs> it wasn't his fault. Right? I mean, the, this is the, the, the question is, what does the system do about it, not are there individual races? Of course there are individual races. And, of course, this is, and, and here's the thing. This is where not only the legal framework, but the cultural framework comes into play, which is once people do this, if somebody is caught you know, saying the N-word to a black student on campus, and it, then their name is blown up in the media, how, how hard do you think it's going to be for that person to get a job for a long time? That's the first thing, any, anytime they Google that person's name, that's the first thing that comes up, and no one wants to hire a racist. There are very severe societal ramifications and penalties for this kind of behavior. And, that's, and I, I believe fully in the idea that the culture and the society should punish people who act badly. The idea that the administration is responsible for every little thing that goes on is this godlike view of, of government and the administration that I find personally reprehensible. Take responsibility for yourselves and recognize that individuals do bad things, and that's not always the fault of the people in charge. Hi. Okay. Um, so I have a question. So, what is your feelings on um, like social conservatism and politics today? Like being anti-drug war, anti-evolution. Do you think that's a winning strategy for Republicans to be a, like on the side? Well, I mean, I, I don't know that that being anti-evolution is a particularly Republican oh. position. I mean, I'm I'm not anti-evolution. I believe in, yeah, yeah, in yeah. evolution. Oh, um, uh, like. Um, Anti-gay marriage, um, like pro-drug war, and kind of stuff that's... So to, be, to, so to be fair, you can't ask me about the drug war because I'm actually personally pretty libertarian when it comes to okay. particularly soft drugs like marijuana. But, yeah. um, so that's... And, and I've by the way, I've never, smoked, uh, I've never smoked a joint, and I find people who do so gross and you smell, so please don't. But I also think that the government sucks at everything, and obviously the war on marijuana has been a giant fail since anybody could get a baggie from their fifth grade friend. Um, so the, so you know, the, um, a, as far as social conservatism, and, and what's, what's the actual question? As like, far do you think it's a winning strategy for the Republicans to be touting, like, oh, I'm pro-drug war? Or so I, I don't think, I don't, okay, so two things. One, I don't define my morality based on winning strategy, yeah, yeah. meaning that I, I don't think that major, majoritarianism is not a substitute for values. If, if there are five people in a room and three of them vote for something evil, that doesn't make evil good. So that's, you know, I'm not a moral relativist. So if I believe in traditional marriage and that traditional marriage is more valuable to society on a non even, not a, not a religious level, on a purely secular level, that traditional marriage is a foundation stone of society uh, and homosexual marriage actually produces nothing of value to society. It may produce something of value for the individuals involved, but nothing for society at large. Uh, then, you know, that's my view and I don't really care what the majority has to say about that. Uh, and, and as far as pro-life, I feel the exact same way, which is if you're going to kill a baby, it's still incumbent on me to tell you to not kill a baby, even if you are going to pretend that the baby isn't a baby. I mean, there was a position in this, in this country for a very long time where a majority of people in the country thought that black people were not humans and could therefore be kept as slaves. That didn't make it okay. It was still wrong. So, uh, you know, right is right and wrong is wrong. So I think as far as, you know, where do the American people stand right now? I think the American people are getting more pro-life. I think they're also getting more pro-gay marriage. Uh, so I think that you know, my own perspective on same-sex marriage has been for years now that the government just ought to get entirely out of the business of marriage. That you know, I have myself, you know, I, have, I, have two, uh, I have two marital, and I'm a, a huge proponent of traditional marriage, and I'm not a proponent at all of homosexual marriage. I am, but I, have two, my, I personally have two marriage certificates. Right? I have my religious marriage certificate. It's called the Ketubah. Right, and it's, it's a Jewish marriage certificate. Uh, and then I have my state marriage certificate. I don't care at all about my state marriage certificate. My Jewish marriage certificate I care about because it meant I could have sex with my wife. So, that's, <laughs> so, the, so, the, so my feeling is I don't understand what interest the state really has 
in traditional marriage at all, considering they've really effed it up in a lot of ways. Uh, and so, you know, just get out. Because the, because the problem is that once the state starts saying that homosexual marriage is on par with traditional marriage, now you get the problem of churches have to recognize homosexual marriages. Businesses have to recognize homosexual marriages. We're going to cram it down on you uh, in, in your personal life if you personally disapprove. And that is a violation of both freedom of religion, freedom of association, and freedom of speech. Well, oh, I guess, couldn't you, um, you don't have to go to a church to get a marriage license. Right, right? this is what I'm saying. If, you want, if, you, if two gay guys want to go down to a liberal church and get a marriage license, I don't care. It makes no difference to me. Yeah. I'm not banning it. But, is, like, but, you, you but I shouldn't have to bake a cake for their wedding. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I agree. Uh, but um, kind of implied that like, uh, religious like, churches are involved when they aren't really involved. So is it... In what? I mean, religious churches marry people. This is what they... Yeah, do. yeah. But like, um, you said the state needs to get out of... Or the state needs to get out right, of... The state needs, needs to get Right. The state needs to stop giving benefits for marriage and defining the nature of marriage. The state needs to get out of it because it's a losing battle. Hi, yes, I know this topic hasn't been touched on tonight, but global warming and the fact that the left will say that it's more important than the issues we're facing now with ISIS, or right. our crappy economy, and the fact that people say cow, cows farting in a field are uh, the cause of global warming. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when it comes to global warming, uh, there, there are two issues. Is there such a thing as the greenhouse gas effect? The answer is yes. Is that something that is going to dramatically reshape our world? There is no evidence to show that it will. And is that something that we can stop? There's no evidence to show that we can. So, you know, when it comes to we should all throw our cars in the river because we have to prevent the, the, global, the, the global temperature from rising a percentage of a Celsius degree over the next century, it seems to me a very godlike view of what human beings are, are capable of, um, particularly since the weatherman can't predict the weather tomorrow, but even climatologists can't predict 10 years from now. I mean, they still can't explain why there's been no warming trend over the last 15 years, right? There's been an absolute static trend with regard to global temperatures over the last 15 years. Uh, so I'm not in the mood for throwing out the, by the way, the one shot that poor people have of becoming rich in the carbon-based economy in order to prevent a slight rise in temperature. Uh, as far as the notion that climate change is more important than terrorism or, or the economy or any of this other stuff, like, you know, this is, Paul Krugman wrote a column yesterday saying exactly this. He said, Paris is bad, but we should really keep our eye on the ball, climate change. And, and, I mean, you, 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 you have to be highly educated to be this stupid. Uh, uh, sorry, hold on. <laughs> sorry, I'm back. Um, okay, so this is from Summer at Summer Elizam. Um, she wants to know, has there ever been an experience in which you thought public expression went too far and it should be curbed? Uh, have I? Sure. Uh, I mean, in terms of should, should the government come in and, and prosecute somebody for public expression? Um, I've actually changed my views on this over time. I've become significantly more libertarian over the past seven years as I've watched the president try to crack down on particular kinds of public expression. Uh, you know, do, it's, do I think that local communities have the capacity? On a, I, I do think there's a difference between federal, state, and local. So let me start there. I think that there, is, there are two questions. One is the principle of freedom of speech and what would I want in my community, and one is what is in the power of local communities versus federal communities? And these are actually two separate questions. I don't think the federal government should be in the business of regulating speech in pretty much any way. I think that local communities, if, I, if, I, if my little town doesn't want pornography in my little town, I think my little town has the right to ban pornography. I don't think that the founders died on, on, the, on the fields of battle to protect Hugh Hefner putting out naked ladies. I just don't. Um, and, and so, you know, and, and this is a pretty well established First Amendment doctrine as well. So the, the you know, the, as far as you know, kind of general principles of free speech, I don't think that there is any aspect of political speech that should ever be curbed. I think all aspects of political speech are on the table. I think that there is a difference between political speech and, for example, flag burning. I, I don't think that flag burning is an expression of free speech. I disagree with the 1989 decision that suggested that free speech was implicated by burning a flag because you're not. There, there are certain there are certain things that hold us together, and that is one of the very few that does. Uh, and the fact that for 200 years everybody interpreted the First Amendment to prevent, to, to allow local regulations preventing flag burning is relatively good historical evidence that the founders weren't that fond of it either. So are there certain cases? Yes. Are we anywhere near that on this campus? Absolutely not. Uh, hi. Um, I would ask what you would say to some of the students 
students who are kind of indifferent about what's going on, maybe not really far to the left or super far to the right either, and just kind of want to get their degree, get a good job, and move on with their lives. Kind of mm -hmm. like the gentleman at Dartmouth who just said, when they were chanting Black Lives Matter in the library, he just said, I'm just trying to study for a test tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, what, what, would you be, what would your suggestion be for those students? I mean, my suggestion would be, it's a perfect example, the one that you're using. My example would be, well, you're not getting to study, are you? Right? Meaning that you can try to stay apathetic. You can try to stay out of harm's way. You can try to avoid the battle. You can try to you know, maintain your neutrality. You can try to say that I just want to live my life and be left alone. The left will not leave you alone. You are a tool. Okay, for, for, for the left, which is in search of utopia, every human being is either a tool or an obstacle. They're either, you're either somebody that, that, out, that they can get to ally with them and they can, and they can force that, or, they, or, or you're an obstacle to be overcome and to be destroyed. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's, the easy answer is always, I'm just trying to study for a test, and I have sympathies. I think all of us in life have other priorities that are higher than politics. The problem is politics intrudes. So, you know, if you want to study for that test, at a certain, at a certain point, you're going to have to say, these people are behaving terribly, and they need to get out of the library, <coughs> right? Because if you don't do that, you're not going to get to study in the library. And if, and if, you, if, if there are no behavioral standard whatsoever, then you, there, there is no safe space for you. If you, if you are not going to, if there are no behavioral standards. I mean, this is, the, we live in a common society. There are behavioral standards by which we all abide, and these include not being aggressive in manner toward people who have not done anything to you. Thank you. I'm Alex. I'm, I came all the way from uh, Lawrence, Kansas to see this. Wow. Hey, okay. That's some <laughs> real hot <laughs> territory. Right there. Um, my question actually changed since I come up here. Um, you said that you've moved more, sort of more libertarian as you've gone on the past couple of years. So a short question for me, and I have another question after this, it's also rather short, is what do you think has been Rand Paul's biggest problem in this campaign? Because early on he was seen as the front runner, but slowly he's fallen towards the bottom. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, so Rand Paul's biggest problem has been ISIS. It turns out that in a Republican primary you can't be an isolationist who wants to cut the fence. That's, that's really been his biggest problem. Uh, and because of that, he, I mean, he's done that. His meeting with Al Sharpton was not a big win for him. There are certain aspects of the libertarian position that seem childish to, to people who vote in Republican primaries, and these include being isolationist on foreign policy and being soft on crime. Criminal justice reform has not been something that, that is popular among the Republican voting base. Uh, you know, on, on, the truth is, when it comes to domestic spending policy, for example, I love Rand Paul when it comes to domestic spending policy. When it comes to his foreign policy, I think he's awful. So the, the, you, you sort of have to have both. Uh, so that, that's why Rand Paul has fallen. And my, my second question is, uh, how do you explain the rise of Donald Trump and how he is still in the front? OK, so uh, this one is always my favorite question. So I've been waiting all night for this. OK, so, so the rise of Donald Trump is explained by, by a couple of factors. The first factor explaining the rise of Donald Trump is that Donald Trump is a hammer in search of a nail. right? And all, everybody is so annoyed with politics and politicians that we just want to see somebody get hammered. And so, it does, so, so Donald Trump, you'll notice, he, he, as a hammer in search of a nail, sometimes he hits a puppy, right? sometimes he hits a glass pane, sometimes he hits a child, and sometimes he hits a nail. And when he hits a nail, it's great. So in the, in the span of the last four days, we saw Donald Trump go from a zero to a 10. Right? He did his horrible speech in Iowa where he was reenacting Ben Carson's stabbing story and taking his belt buckle and moving to the side of the podium and unbuttoning and moving around his belt buckle like a crazy guy. And, then, and everybody was going, what is this? And then two days later, two days later, the, the, or the next day actually, the Paris attacks happen, and he goes on national television, and he's asked what he wants to do, and he says, I would bomb the shit out of them. And most Americans go, okay, I get that. I'm there. All right. <laughs> you know, I don't, need, I don't need a five paragraph essay. I'm cool. We got it, right? Trump has a gift for speaking uh, at the lowest common denominator level, which actually, it's, it actually is a gift. I mean, it means that you communicate with the most people. Uh, and he also has a gift for the soundbite. Uh, bo both for good and for bad. He's also a dramatic slap in the face to the Republican establishment. There's a whole side of, of Republicans who just say, you guys were trying to push Jeb Bush on us. Well, screw you. We're going with Donald Trump. <laughs> and, and so, uh, which is why all these outsider candidates are doing so well. So, you know, I find Trump highly amusing as a candidate. I find him highly amusing as a person. Do I, would I vote for him in a primary? No. Do I think that he, do I, I will tell you one thing about Donald Trump. Donald Trump, there's a solid case to be made. This is not even meant to be funny. There's a solid case to be made that he has a better shot of being president than Marco Rubio. And the reason that I say this is because if you look at how Mitt Romney lost the last election cycle, he lost the last election cycle because five million white voters did not turn out to vote. Uh, Mitt Romney would have had to win. Everybody keeps saying, oh, Marco Rubio will win the Hispanic vote. You know what percentage of the Hispanic vote Mitt Romney would have had to win in order to win in 2012? 
He would have had to win, according to Byron York at the Washington Examiner, 73% of the Hispanic vote in order to win in 2012. So he, he ended up winning, I think the statistic was 27% of the Hispanic vote. Uh, so what's easier, winning 3% more of the white vote or winning 46% more of the Hispanic vote? And the answer is 3% more of the white vote. So who are these white voters who stayed home in 2012? The white voters who stayed home in 2012 were a bunch of blue collar voters in swing states like Ohio. Right? Who do these people like? Donald Trump. If you look at the polls, blue collar voters like Donald Trump. In fact, there's another community that Donald Trump does particularly well, and that's the black community. If you look at the polls of Trump in the black community, he's edging on 20% in the black community, which is an unheard of number. It's unheard of. Trump also has the advantage of celebrity. I mean, you can't put it beyond that. I mean, if, if, if any other candidate without this level of celebrity did the things Trump did, he'd be done. But Trump's a big celebrity. Everybody recognizes his name. And what celebrity does, celebrity makes you feel like you know the person. And we all feel like we know the people that we watch on TV. There's actually a difference between movie stars and TV stars. My mom works in Hollywood. I have a lot of friends who work in Hollywood. One thing that's weird in LA is if you see a TV star, you're likely to walk up to them and say hello. If you see a movie star, you never will. They're sort of unapproachable because they're on a big screen, so you don't know them. Uh, but if you see him on TV, you're like, oh, I know this guy. I see him every single week. He's in my house all the time. Trump, Trump, is, Trump is like that, so people feel like they know him. So when he says something totally crazy, it's like if a friend of yours said something totally crazy, you're like, oh, that's just Lou. You know, Lou's always saying that kind of thing. He doesn't mean it. You know, Lou, he's a good guy. He just says crazy stuff. Whereas if it's somebody you don't know and they say you know, the kind of stuff that Trump says, you go, oh, my God, I can never vote for this person. I don't know this man. And he says these kind of things. So that, that's, why, that's why Trump is, is seeing a significant amount of success. Plus, he has taken a very hard line on immigration, obviously. And that hard line on immigration is resonating with a lot of people who have seen not just a major political shift in the United States, but also see this as, a, as an actual security issue, which clearly it is. As someone pro-life, how would you say a good debate against someone pro-choice would be? What would be a good debate tactic against someone pro-choice? Show them a picture of a baby. End of story. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I think that the, the, the idea that, you know, the, it, well, I was at the 2012 DNC, the, the Democratic National Convention, and, uh, and it was a very bizarre experience because as I was walking around at the 2012 DNC, I, uh, I, I walked past, there, there were a bunch of guys there, and they were wearing buttons that said, I love pro-choice girls. Right? I can't imagine why. And, and, <laughs> and so they're wearing these buttons around, and they, they were walking blithely past a giant display of people who were, who were carrying, it was an anti-abortion protest. They were carrying all of the aborted fetus pictures. And being from LA, I always tend to think, oh, well, that's just uncouth. You know, who, why, why do we have to look at these pictures? They're gross. You know, who, th that's uncouth. And then it occurred to me, screw uncouth, it's true. I mean, the fact is that people have, have a you ruined my day syndrome, which is they don't want to see things that are ugly in everyday life. And when you show them things that are ugly, they get upset. Uh, well, you have to make people feel not morally superior for wanting to kill kids, and these are kids. I mean, Hillary Clinton's position, in the, the Democratic National Committee's position in this race is that one minute before the baby enters the vaginal canal and, and the vagina somehow confers personhood on, on this baby, this is not a person, right? This is the, this is the uh, okay, I don't have to cite my own child as evidence to the contrary, but everybody's child is evidence to the contrary. I mean, the fact is, a very, uh, the abortion argument is a very simple one. Do you, either, you either believe this is a, a human life or a potential human life, or you don't. If you don't, then you can do anything you want with it. If you do, you can't do anything with it. Well, I've heard many pro-life uh, people in my house say that, you know, consensually, if they have a child and they say, no, I don't want to handle it, they can abort it. But what if the woman was raped? What if, you know, it was... Right, so the, the rape and incest question comes up a lot politically. And the answer is that, that rape is an unbelievable evil. And every rapist who is proven to have committed a rape should either be castrated or killed. Okay, this is the truth about what should happen to rapists. Now, killing babies is wrong. Okay, these are, these are two separate questions. They have nothing to do with one another. Connecting these two things is like saying, I was raped, therefore I get to go shoot an unrelated person. That does not, it, this is not to say that it's not emotionally difficult and emotionally horrible and very, and very challenging. And in fact, in Jewish law, and, and this is my own perspective too, is that if, if a woman becomes suicidal over this sort of thing, like if she's, if she's going to kill herself because, the, because, the, because she's so distraught over all of this, then the baby in Jewish law, it's called becoming a rota. If the baby becomes a, a pursuer, and if you have to choose between the life of the mother and the life of the baby, you choose the life of the mother. So the mother's life is in danger, and that includes psychological distress to the point of suicide, but only to the point of suicide. But other than that, it's a human life. What are you doing? So the, and the two are unrelated. And it's just a way of, again, it's, a, it's an emotional argument to muddy the waters because I mean, it's amazing to me that the same people on the left 
who say, well, shouldn't a, a raped woman be allowed to abort her baby? These are the same people who want to release, rape, release rapists from prison after five years. Right? If, you, if you really want to stop this from happening, here's a solution. Go prosecute, castrate, and kill rapists. That's a really good solution. Uh, I have another solution. Let women carry guns and train them how to use them. So anytime they're in a position of rape, they shoot the guy. The, the left solution seems to be to stop the baby. My solution is to stop the rape. Okay, so just a little announcement. Um, the last questions are going to be from everyone who's in line, so no one else get in line. <laughs> uh, okay, so this question is from Danielle Ferrandino um, at D Ferrandino six two five. Uh, she wants to know if you have anything to say about the <coughs> black conservative Jasmine Wells, who is called an Uncle Tom for supporting Thomas Jefferson here on campus. Well, I mean, I think that, that the Uncle Tom slur is a terrible one and should not be used against anybody on, be, on, because of their race. I mean, it's racism. Uh, as far as the, the, the hatred of Thomas Jefferson, I, I like the ahistoric person. It's so funny. The left will constantly say, you know, with regard to people like ISIS, well, you have to understand the context. You always have to understand the context. When it comes to people like Thomas Jefferson, the context goes completely out the window. Thomas Jefferson would not have accepted Caitlyn Jenner as a woman, and therefore Thomas Jefferson was bad. Right? So, this is, so we, we use modern standards of what constitutes morality and completely ignore whatever was the common morality of the time. And believe me, for most of human history, there was a lot of bad morality that was prevailing. You know, Thomas Jefferson held slaves. That's an evil thing to hold slaves. Thomas Jefferson also signed into law the first law banning the international slave trade. Right? The fact is everybody who likes to rip on Western civilization because of the, the practice of slavery, Western civilization is the only civilization that actually ended it. Right? I mean, the, 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 the state of Saudi Arabia didn't outlaw slavery until 1962. 1962, right? I mean, your parents were born. Um, so the, so you know, the, the kind of Thomas Jefferson must be run out of town on a rail, it's ahistoric. If we're, going to, if we're going to rewrite history every generation, and the only good people are the people who were just born five minutes ago, right, then, then we're never going to have any history that's worth revering or writing. And you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Every person has goods. Every person has bads. And to pretend that we, we have a tendency as humans just to paint everybody as a, a total saint or a total sinner, it's not true. People are sinners. People are saints. They're both at the same time. I have a question about foreign policy, since you uh, mentioned like, who you kind of support, who you disagree with. Uh, specifically having to do with the Middle East, what do you think should be done when you have uh, radical groups like ISIS coming through, or you have dictators controlling countries, you could say legally because they were elected or took power, what do you think should be done? Should it just be, uh, well, I'll just leave that up to you, what do you think should be done? What is in our interest? I mean, and this, I mean this very seriously, meaning that the, if, if, if you believe that America is a beacon of liberty in the world, then strengthening that beacon is useful. I identifying allies that are, that are helpful to us is, is useful. We can't invade every bad place on planet Earth, uh, obviously. There are too many bad places on planet Earth. Uh, we have to consider the costs and the benefits of each particular situation. You know, for example, when people ask what I would do about Iran, for example, well, what I say is that there is obviously an incipient democratic movement in Iran. We should decapitate the leadership. We don't need a full-scale war. Just kill all the leaders. We know where they live. I mean, what's wrong with this? I mean, the, the, and, and by the way, the, the idea that we can't, the, 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 the kind of, it's, it's amazing to me that, that we still have this myth that we use, that we're anti-assassination, we won't kill any foreign leaders. Hillary Clinton sat on national TV and chortled about Muammar Gaddafi being killed, right? <laughs> she sat there and she said, he came, he, we came, we saw, he died, right? And she was laughing about it. Um, the, the question is, what is in the interests of the West, because the West is, is, as the West grows and as the West power grows, the world gets better. As the West power diminishes, the world gets to be a worse place. Uh, so, each so each situation sort of has to be judged on its own merits. If you're asking specifically about ISIS, uh, I like Donald Trump's answer that we should bomb the shit out of them. Um, I, also, I also am not averse, I, I, I'm not a fan of, I'm gonna take certain, certain abilities off the table. So when Barack Obama says there will never be ground troops, well, okay, so now they know there will never be ground troops, so they plan their strategy accordingly, right? They move in among civilians. They understand that we can't bomb from 30,000 feet because we'll kill a ton of civilians. This is what Hamas does in, in the Gaza Strip. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the answer on ISIS is, is this an important enough threat for us to go in and wipe them out? And once we've wiped them out, do we actually want to occupy the region? And I'm not averse to occupying the region. The fact is that the, the number of Americans who were being killed in Iraq by the end of the occupation was extraordinarily low. For all of the talk about 
the, the you know, horrible, horrible Iraq War, between three and 4,000 American troops died during the Iraq War to defeat the fourth largest military on planet Earth and then clean up a country with one of the widest insurgencies on planet Earth. More people than that were killed in, in certain hours of the Civil War. So you know, the, the President Obama the other day, he basically said that we only have two choices. We can either occupy for 100 years or we can't do anything, basically. We can do pinprick bombing. I don't think that's true. I think that you can do heavy bombing, number one. I think number two, you can cut off economic resources. I think number three, you can decapitate leaders that you don't like. And then if there's a bad leader who comes up in their wake, you kill that leader too. We have lots of bombs. Uh, and <laughs> Um, but you know, it, a realistic perspective on each individual problem is necessary. I don't think there's a blanket policy, in other words, that is, that is available for every particular situation. Mr. Shapiro. My name is Richard Maggio. I'm a reporter from Chicago. I cover a lot of the shootings in Chicago. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been doing this since 2013. And uh, I don't see Black Lives Matter anywhere in Chicago. I don't see them protesting. I don't see them acknowledging what's happening there. Shouldn't that alone um, delegitimize this group? Absolutely. And Black Lives Matter is, is, a, is, a, is a joke. Black Lives Matter is a, is a movement that is designed specifically and solely uh, to crack down on, on political enemies of the left. The, the, the Black Lives Matter movement is a racist movement. If there were any converse movement saying white lives matter, everyone would recognize it as such. And again, the Black Lives Matter crew doesn't say that all black lives matter. They say the only black lives that matter are black people who are killed by white people, right, which is a tiny, tiny number across the United States. I mean, if we were to reverse the situation, significantly more white people are killed by black people every year than black people are killed by white people every year. Um, but the reality is that if you actually want to make life better for black, if black lives actually mattered, there'd be a few things that you'd want to do. The number one thing you'd want to do is stop aborting black babies. More black babies were aborted in New York City last year than were born in New York City last year. I mean, literally entire generations of black people have been wiped off the face of the earth by people who are getting abortions. Uh, the second thing that you would do is actually have a very heavy police presence in high crime areas because that's the only way that you, de you develop a culture of property ownership and investment that creates jobs, that creates better lifestyles for people. And the third thing that you would do is cut off benefits and, and, and diminish benefits for people making bad decisions. You don't incentivize people to have babies out of wedlock. Right? It's, it's, our culture has now conferred hero, hero status on people who put themselves in self-victimized situations. My wife is in medical school over at UCLA, and my wife has made a lot of good decisions in her life. The number one, of course, is marrying me. The number two, <laughs> the number two good decision for my wife, and she's watching right now, so I know she's laughing. Um, the number two uh, good decision for my wife is that we were both virgins until we got married. We're religious people, and she and she, you know, we had our baby, our first baby, uh, about two years ago, January 2014, uh, and she took a year off of school to take care of the baby because she wanted to spend time with the baby, and then she went back to school, right? And that's just what she did. She was not conferred hero status. There was a girl in her class who was a single mother and had to work her way through being a single mother. And she's granted this sort of hero status. So look at all the challenges she's had to overcome. Right, challenges that she made for herself. I'm glad she overcame them. It would have been better if she didn't make the challenges for herself in the first place. We need to stop creating heroes out of people who make poor decisions. Right? It's great that you can overcome a challenge, but don't create challenges for yourself and then be celebrated for the challenges that you created for yourself. So you know, incentivizing fathers to stay in the home would be a massive thing. And again, the, the, if, if there's one thing that is leading to, to crime in the black community right now, it is the escalating rate of single motherhood, because that's true in every community that has high crime rates. It has high rates of single motherhood for a very specific reason. Young men commit crimes. Young men are not afraid of their mothers. Right? Every guy in this audience right now knows that at age 15, if your mom told you to cut it out, the chances were she was going to have to call your dad. Right? The fact is, young men do not fear a, 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 an authority structure that comes from mom. That's just not the way that it works. So you know, that's, there, there are many things that Black Lives Matter actually could do if they, if they actually believed Black Lives Matter, but they don't. What they actually believe is just that America is a racist, terrible system, and it has to be torn out, it has to be torn out by the roots, and, and whatever is available for them to do this, they will do. And this is true for most of the left, including the concerned student in 1950. Ben Carson has been an increasingly popular presidential candidate, but a lot of people have had questions about his lack of political background. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering what your take and stance on that was. So I think Ben Carson is a very good man. Um, I think that Ben Carson says a lot of things that are worthwhile, and he, and he creates debates that I think ought to be had. Um, I think that he has strength of character and fortitude. 
his lack of experience is not really what troubles me. It's, it's I don't know where he stands on certain issues because he doesn't have enough knowledge to stand on the issue. Right? So when he's asked about foreign policy, maybe he has great principles, maybe he doesn't, but he, he's kind of waving around in the wind. He doesn't, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And so my view of, of, of presidential candidates is, I think one of the great myths in American life is that, it's, it's, is that being president is the world's most difficult job. You have a personal service staff of two million people. I'm pretty sure that you can do it. Um, you know, the, this idea that you have to have tremendous executive experience, it's not like running a company because you never get to fire anybody. Uh, they, they, they all have government contract. Um, you know, it, it, really, it really has much more to do, being a good president has much more to do with having a good value system than it does with having tremendous executive experience or tremendous foreign policy experience. I want to know what your values are. So on domestic policy, I know Ben Carson's values and I like Ben Carson's values, at least the vast majority of them. On foreign policy, I don't know Ben Carson's values and so I don't know enough to like his values. But values to me trump experience every time. It wouldn't bother me that, that, that Abraham Lincoln had served a single term in the Illinois Congress before becoming president and losing a Senate race you know, to Stephen Douglas. That, that doesn't bother me. And, it, it didn't, and, and I thought it was a stupid argument that Obama had no experience and therefore he shouldn't be president. I, I don't think inexperience is, is a, I don't think inexperience explains the terrible president Obama has been. We've had, we've had many inexperienced presidents and none of them have done this kind of damage. Ideology, values explain the terrible president that President Obama has been. He shouldn't have been voted for because of his values, not because he didn't, if he'd sat in the Senate for seven terms, he would be just as radical and just as bad at his job. Thanks so much. Well, thanks so much. I'm just going to have to yell because we don't have another mic, but uh, I'd like to thank every single one of you for coming out, uh, especially my uh, liberal roommates. I'd have dragged them out here, but uh, there's, there's some tissues for you guys in the back if anything you said triggered you guys. But ever, seriously, guys, this is incredible. Uh, it's, an ama it's amazing, really, what we can do as a group. We can really stand upon our beliefs. I mean, we are standing, we're in a part of uh, society where we're trying to fight kind of sacrifice that notion. But anyways, uh, I'd love to meet some of you guys. We're going to draw this to an end. Uh, if you're a CR, try to make your way to the front rounds. We're going to get a picture with Ben before he heads off. But uh, everybody, thank you for coming out.
been multiplied by five or six, so we probably have like 20 to 50,000 in the years. And I know the analytics are pretty soon, but it's not. You know, a lot of that's a big number for a lot of people. Check it out right now and see if we get. I don't know if the analytics will be available, but it's very good live numbers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 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 Luke Livingston, Luke.